ಸರ್ ಇದು ಎ ಐ ಸಿ ಟಿ ಲೆಟರ್ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕಂತ ಎಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿದಾರ ಸರ್ Thank you, thank you, bye. Thanks. Sir, what is that? Yes. ಹಲೋ ಸರ್ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಿದೆ ಈಗ ಆಡಿಯೋ ಸರ್ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಿದೆಯಾ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಿದಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ ಸರ್ ಕೇಳಿ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಸರ್ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಓಕೆ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸರ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಓಕೆ ಓಕೆ ಬಾಯ್ ಪರ್ಫೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಗಿ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಸರ್ ಏನ್ ತೊಂದರೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ಹಾ ಹೌದು ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಸರಿ ಸರ್
I request all of you to please your mobile phones in silent mode. Seeking the blessings of His Holiness, Jagadguru Dr. Sri Shivratri Rajendra Mahaswamiji and His Holiness, Sri Shivratri Deshikendra Mahaswamiji, on behalf of GSS Academy of Technical Education, Bengaluru, I, Anuradha MG, feel honored and privileged to welcome you all to the second series of Learn from Leaders. It is indeed our great honor to have amidst us Captain G.R. Gopinath, the pointer of India's low-cost airline, Air Deccan, which is known as Common Man's Airline. Air Deccan was the largest airline in terms of its network, the number of passengers flown, and its fleet size. The only uh, company which overtook Indian Airlines and gained the second largest market share. Who is not known about the Tamil film, Sururai Puturu, which is based on Captain G.R. Gopinath. Here, we have a short clipping which tells uh, all about him.
Uh, thank you, sir. Um, it's indeed our great honor to have you again, Ms. Dutt, sir. Thank you for being with us. Um, when we kneel to God, he stands up for us. And when he stands up for us, no one can stand against us. Hence, it is a mark of our undying tradition to invoke the Almighty at the beginning of an important event. Uh, with a strong belief, I call upon Samat G. Rao to present an invocation song. Kalisu Guruve Kalisu Kalisu Guruve Kalisu Kalisu Sat Guruve Ni Kalisu Kalisu Sat Guruve Ni Kalisu Kalisu Guruve Kalisu Kalisu Guruve Kalisu Sullina Naduve Na Satyavanada Lukalisu Sullina Naduve Na Satyavanada Lukalisu Swarthada Naduve Niswartia Galukalisu Swarthada Naduve Niswartia Galukalisu Anji Nadevara Naduve Dirana Galukalisu Anji Nadevara Naduve Dirana Galukalisu Mereva Dushter Nadu Janana Galukalisu, Mereva Dushteranadue, Janana Galukalisu, Kalisu, Guruve Kalisu, Kalisu, Guruve Kalisu, Jagavella Vanta Gijarita Rusari, Nananena Nambu Bagani Kalisu, Jagavella Vanta Gijarita Rusari. Nana nena nambu bagani kalisu Aluvina li avama novel lovem Buddha kalisu Aluvina li avama novel lovem Buddha kalisu Mana vi a tea Mere you would a nuni kalisu Mana vi a tea Mere you would a nuni kalisu Kalisu Guru ve kalisu Kalisu Guru ve kalisu Hattu halavara naduve na na galu kalisu Hattu halavara naduve na na galu kalisu Jana na galu kalisu Jana na galu kalisu Jana na galu kalisu Jana na galu kalisu Kalisu Guru ve kalisu Kalisu Guru ve kalisu Thank you. Thank you so much for the divine melody. I now request Dr. Dia Swami. Professor, IEM Department, to deliver the welcome address. Good morning to one and all present here. Elrugu Namskara. Welcome to JCCT campus and also welcome to this uh, session. So this session is arranged by CAR, Center for Interdisciplinary Research. Um, a platform created to promote um, interdisciplinary research. So we work uh, closely with various stakeholders promoting inter interdisciplinary research. Apart from that, we also this kind of innovative programs. So we last a uh, uh, couple of months back, we uh, launched this program called uh, Learn from Leaders. The first session was by Sadhanand Maya today. We have the second session, which is by Captain G.R. Gopinath. So no need to uh, tell about Captain, Captain Gopinath. He's a well-known personality in airline industry. He's the man 
who made the aviation airline um, um, connectivity even affordable for the common man. So his uh, flights are known as common man flights. So this is the, uh, he is a very philanthropic, social concerned personality. Today he is with us on behalf of everyone here. We would like to welcome you. Welcome you, sir. I request Aravind, Dr. Arvind, to present the bouquet. Today, we have Dr. Suresh, Rose Chancellor of JSS AHR. He is the source of inspiration. He is an eminent leader in academic field, known personality across the country, especially in uh, medical and pharmaceutical education. He is the source of inspiration. Whatever the pro program we design and implement, always he support us in implementation. He is, he is known for uh, his innovativeness in academic field. Today he is with us on behalf of everyone. I want to welcome you, sir. Welcome you, sir. Another guest of honor, uh, Dr. Uh, H.R. Made Swami, because of his personal uh, reason, he is not able to make it today. So in his absence, I we convey our sincere thanks to him for his all, ever, all his um, support and uh, motivation. So next, our uh, beloved principal, Dr. Beam Sen. So he is also an um, academic leader and he is the campus leader. Whatever we do, he supports and he uh, motivates us in implementation. I request uh, 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 Jaydev Oppa to welcome him with a bouquet. Today, today we have uh, participants from other institution and also we are implementing this um, program in blended mode. Across the country, we have 500 participants registered for this program. We have participation from University of Kashmir. There are 50 students and faculty registered for this. We have the participation from the institutions like Presidency University, Crescent University, uh, Sairam Institution, Chennai, like that. Uh, from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, we have uh, registration. On uh, behalf of JSSATA, I welcome all the participants who registered online and they are uh, logged in for this uh, session. And we have uh, deans, HODs, section heads, and also we have uh, our administrative officer, chief administrative officer, Viresh. He is also very supportive force. Whatever the program we do, he supports us. I would like to welcome him with a bouquet. I request Jagdish Prabhu to present the bouquet and welcome Dr. Viresh. So the most important is our students. So seeing you, all of you are waiting for the speech of uh, Captain G. So let us um, definitely his uh, speech are uh, available in uh, YouTube's very inspirational and very motivational uh, talk. So we will listen to his talk. And also I welcome all of you for this session. So over to Madam. Thank you, sir. A ray of light is a ray of hope. Light is a symbol of brightness and prosperity. Let us all leave the darkness and step towards the bright path. Now, we shall have our traditional auspicious lamp lighting ceremony 
as a tribute to the Lord. I now request, principal, all the dignitaries and the conveners to light the lamp and symbolically inaugurate this program. May the darkness of ignorance be swept away by the dawn of self-realization. Thank you all. I now request Dr. B. Suresh, Director, JSS Mahavidya Peta Mysore, to address the gathering. Good morning to everyone. At the outset, I extend my warm greetings and blessings conveyed by His uh, Holiness Swamiji for the success of this program. Uh, respected Dr. Gopinath, who is an eminent leader and uh, his own powerful personality resonates across the country by his courage, conviction and compassion. Um, greetings to you, Dr. Gopinath Ji. We are indeed very happy uh, that you are amidst us and trying to inspire more readers. Uh, all JSFs and our uh, Swamiji to our campus and we look forward to hearing to your very inspiring speech. Sir. Uh, at the same time, I extend warm greetings and welcome to uh, the principal, Dr. Swami and all my other colleagues, uh, uh, faculties at uh, the JSSAT Bangalore campus. Warm greetings to you and best wishes for the new year because it's the first time I am interacting with you after the new year. Warm greetings to you for the new year. And of course, my dear beloved students, uh, greetings to you and best wishes to you. I think uh, you are starting off your new year in a very, very good tone by listening to Captain Gopinath, the inspirational person behind many innovations and uh, challenges in life. I think if you take even one leaf out of his life and try to emulate, your success is assured. I think this is something which is very, very important. The books and uh, the lectures and other things are teaching you the foundation. What you want to become an engineer or a, a professional, whichever way you are looking at, but the life experiences uh, of such persons like Captain Gopinath teach you what you want to become. I think that's very important to uh, do. And uh, that's where I am uh, very 
uh, uh, stating to you that you are indeed fortunate to start off your year with such a inspirational lecture to you uh, this morning. I would like to say, because I myself am a little passionate in uh, uh, training the future leaders and uh, continue to participate in such training programs, I would have loved to be present there today with uh, Captain Gopinath and listen to him and learn from him also. Uh, I'm sure uh, there will be other opportunities for me to invite him to Mysore also and listen to him in person and interact. Uh, but for now, I'll satisfy myself listening on the uh, uh, on the YouTube and the live show, live relay that is taking place. Uh, talking of leadership, uh, I was thinking of uh, three important facets, which perhaps uh, as I have known Captain Gopinath's uh, uh, life uh, uh, journey, I have, I have seen uh, uh, three things which have stood uh, uh, very outstanding and perhaps I would like to hear from him uh, how he achieved these three things uh, uh, which helped him to be who he is. Uh, one is uh, team building. I mean, learning a, flying a airline in India with all the government uh, procedures and processes and uh, getting through that is not an easy task. And to be courageous, to be the first one to enter into the field, and uh, see that how you can compete with some of the big giants is not again a much easier task. So I think uh, how he achieved that, how this team building and the efforts that he put through, who believed in his dream, who believed in his vision and shared with it and stood by him through the struggle, I think is something which will be very, very inspirational for all of us. And I look forward to hear uh, from him. The second important thing is like, you know, uh, as a leader, I think when you are trying to form some new uh, enterprise, there will definitely be, there will be some mistakes which we will do and perhaps uh, learn from that and try to see how we can avoid that mistake in future and move, move forward. I'm sure there would have been many uh, such uh, situations which would have come uh, in his journey of this uh, particular uh, enterprise which he put forward across the country. And that I call is learning from the uh, mistakes. How did the leaders learn from the mistakes and try to uh, make sure that uh, these things become a part of our life journey. Uh, I think that's something very interesting. And the most important thing, they become very, very possessive of their uh, uh, role and uh, the position. The leaders become very possessive of their role and position. And quite often because of that, uh, uh, that uh, the dream they have or the passion they have, uh, they don't let go of that and uh, they think their whole purpose of life uh, revolves only on making their uh, that going on with the same dream which they have. Uh, that means in a, putting it in a simple word, when to exit? When does the leader feel that it is time for us to exit and move out? I can give one simple example which just happened in uh, these three, four days or three or two, three weeks uh, is the Prime Minister of New Zealand who was very young, who was just 40 years old and she had done excellent work in the um, in the as a prime minister during the COVID period and controlled the whole uh, country in a very nice way. She decided one day that she wants to step down and just she said, I am 40, I know, um, but I have used all my material and I have consumed everything which I can give to the country and it is not fair for me to continue when I know that I cannot deliver further. And she stepped down. I think you should have a lot of courage to uh, come out of that situation. You are a prime minister of a country and you are letting go because you feel that you cannot deliver further and somebody else should do it. I think when to exit. I think uh, I, I admire again uh, Captain Gopinath because when I heard the news that uh, uh, Aaron Deccan is going to uh, be given away, I think it must have involved a lot of courage, a lot of contemplation, a uh, lot of uh, thinking behind that. And uh, I would love to hear uh, how did that process, when to exit? And that's what makes him a great leader. A leader is not what somebody who keeps possessive about what he is having and tell this is my dream project, I will not let go, or this is what I am going to do. And uh, this, this type of possessiveness always comes to us and uh, we don't try to give up our uh, such attachments to the things. I think you have to have a lot of courage to do it. And I really admire you, sir, for that. And I would like to know the secret. How did you achieve that? and uh, perhaps uh, learn from you from there. So I will not take more time. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. We are indeed immensely pleased. And once again, I welcome all of you and I look forward to hearing your inspirational talks. So thank you very much. Welcome, sir.
Thank you, sir. Your words will always motivate and inspire us to do better. Thank you. Captain Gopinath hails from a small town known, uh, known as Goruru, located in Hassan district, Karnataka. He finished his early schooling at Sainik Military School, Bijapur, and joined the famed National Defense Academy. And after his graduation, he was appointed as an officer of an Indian army. Once he joined the army, Captain Gop Gopinath served for eight years before he retired from the armed forces. Thereafter, he became interested in farming and later started a hotel in Hassan. In the year 1995, the government took measures to improve the aviation sector in India and several rules were relaxed in order to encourage entrepreneurs to invest and explore air transportation. The reforms initiated by the government did see positive results as many new players started to show a keen interest in the sector. Captain Gopinath was also one of them. It was him and uh, his close friend from the armed services who came together with an idea to start a private commercial helicopter services known as Deccan Aviation. In 1990, the service became operational while Bangalore became uh, its headquarters. The helicopter services extended to cities like Ahmedabad, Cochin, Delhi, Indore, Mumbai, Chennai, Kolkata, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Jamshedpur, and many more. This aviation company began with just a single helicopter, but currently boasts a fleet that commutes across several destinations in country. In 2003, Captain Gopinath began his first aircraft service known as Air Deccan. This air service was a low cost brand. The main aim was to fulfill the common man's dream to fly. Air Deccan was the first of one of the low cost services in India. Coming from the modest background, Captain Gopinath is a multifaceted personality. He comfortably shifted into different guises, an army officer, India's leading businessman, an independent political candidate, an eco-friendly farmer, and a well-known author. With so much diversity to his personality, it is no doubt that he is one of the most interesting and distinguished persons that one can come across. Despite his many roles, he is well known as a pointer of low-cost airlines, a venture capitalist who rev revolutionized the face of Indian aviation in the country. His book, Simply Fly, sheds light on the remarkable journey of his turning his ambitious vision to a successful business story. Unlike other entrepreneurs, Captain Gopinath's attempts to inspire young businessmen in the country have been successful. Captain Gopinath's contribution has won him several accolades. Some of them have been the Rolex Award for Enterprise, Rajyotsava Award, Personality of the Decade Award, and Sir M. Vishweshwaraya Memorial Award. Captain Gopinath has been an important phase of India, India's aviation. His business ideologies transformed the airline sector into a thriving and profitable sector. Today, an airline is no more restricted to just an light group of people, but has become an affordable and feasible transportation means in the country. We are very fortunate to have uh, amongst us uh, Captain Gopinath, sir, and we welcome you again, sir. Thank you for being with us. And it's over to you, sir. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Oh. 
people want to sit down somewhere, or is it okay? Safe to sit down, or? Okay. You can put some chairs and. I'm indeed uh, touched and uh, overwhelmed by this extraordinary generosity you have shown in uh, in your welcome address and also in inviting me to share some of my ideas rather than saying uh, lesson from the leaders, which I'm sure you get it in the classrooms. I'll share many of the stories from my life, which probably uh, you can imbibe or take, you know, each of you in, the, in your own way, interpret it, rather than giving a PowerPoint presentation. So I'll tell you a few stories, and along the way, I will also address a few of the important points. Uh, Dr. Suresh just now mentioned. Uh, come, sit down. I think you can sit here in the center. Come, why don't you? How many of you speak uh, Canada here? Almost all of you. Yeah, just sit one behind the other like in a the theater. Dr. Suresh, uh, the co-chancellor, a distinguished leader and acad academician himself, Principal, Dr. Swami, and distinguished uh, faculty and young students. Yeah, can you settle down? Come on. Yeah, okay. Can all of you switch off your phone in case you have to ask. How many ministers do I have? I'll say, let me see how much I can. Uh, I will. I will also touch on the three points which Dr. Suresh so I think eloquently and very, very pointedly spoke about to share from my own life how did it deal with some of those situations. In fact, I was asking the Dr. Swami in the car whether he could show that Eric and film, which I forgot to mention to him in the last few days when I was speaking to him. And it so happened, he said, you're already prepared for that. So some kind of a telepathy. Thank you very much. Uh, that school you saw in that film was a similar school that I went to in a small village in Hassan district called Guru. I just listen now. I don't. I, I get disturbed if you talk. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, I went to a school exactly like that. And that idea of that film came to me on an A Deccan flight. Excuse me. Yeah, hello. Excuse me. Not that way. Don't talk to me, please. Uh, so, sorry about it. I just uh, want to focus on my talk. I, I was on a flight on Edekin from Delhi to Bangalore. And uh, I normally go on the flight along with the air hostess and serve snacks and water. Because we would sell even water on the flight to give the lowest fare. And 
there are a lot of people who are flying for the first time. I could make out from their clothes, from their language, from the way they behaved on the flight. I knew that they were first time flying. We had a lot of tickets on every flight, which were one rupee and 500 rupees and 1,000 rupees. As against 13,000 rupees between a Bangalore and Delhi flight. Of course, not all tickets were one rupee or 500 rupees. They were sprinkled in every flight. Maybe I've given away more than three, four lakh tickets at one rupee and 500 rupees. And in fact, Dr. Swami told me on the flight, on the car while coming, that he had gone to Delhi uh, for a, on a task of JSS College, JSS institution to Delhi on a one rupee ticket twice. So that um, uh, sort of that ran in my heart. So on that flight, I found a lady uh, with whom I was talking to, and I asked her. Welcome. I asked the lady who was from my village, I said, where are you from? She was sitting with her husband. She said, I'm from uh, a place in UP near uh, uh, Faisalabad. And uh, so I said, what are the, uh, how did you buy this ticket? She said, my son works in Infosys. And he got a 500 rupee ticket and he went to Chennai. And they were on this flight. So when the aircraft landed in Bangalore, she stood on the middle of the aisle of the aircraft and she looked at the pilot through the door of the pilot door, which was open, a small pilot with a big aircraft with 180 passengers behind. And she said, Captain Saab, you have to go to Hanuman, Jedi Booty, Hanuman, you have to go to Hanuman. So she was describing it uh, in that language where she had heard Ramayana of Hanuman bringing that entire mountain for that Sanjini. And um, that's when this idea came to me that uh, I must make an advertisement film uh, which doesn't look like an advertisement. So we called the ad agency and uh, I told him that, you know, I, I want a film to be made which is emotionally powerful, which uh, inspires people to travel by air without uh, putting the kind of, you know, rich man, poor man kind of thing, where a, a village person can dream of flying because in those days, they were not even envying to fly. They didn't even miss flying. And that's how this uh, film was made, and it became a very successful film. Thanks for showing it, uh, Dr. Swami. Um, you know, it was Goethe, the German poet, who said, dare to dream and begin it. Dare to dream and begin it. Boldness has genius, magic, and power to it. So I think all of entrepreneurship in one way is that ability to dream, because sometimes we don't even want to dream. We don't even think that we can dream about certain things which almost look impossible to fly. As Walt Disney said, was from a very poor family, he said, if you can dream it, you can do it, which is very true. But the dreaming alone is not enough. The dream has to be combined with venture. No, it's not enough to look at, look at the stairs, you have to step up the stairs. So many of us dream, but we do not do. So from that knowing to doing, if you don't have the latter, if you don't do the second part, but you know it, whatever you may have, talent you may have, it amounts to nothing. So there's a power that resides in each of us. And that power is unique to each of us. And only you, you know what that power is, but you will never know unless you try and explore what is it that you can do. And you will only know that power when you do it. So, in addition to dreaming, it's not enough to dream. You need to 
you need to get others to buy into your dream. See, in all of life, whether in your family, whether as a father to your children, or to your wife, or a husband, every one of us, if you want others to come on your dream, you have to be able to sell that dream. They should, they should buy into your dream. So I was studying in a village school. My father was a teacher in the local school. I went barefoot to your school. I, and I started my first uh, class in my fifth standard because my father said, you know, that in school, in any case, I kind of a, was a great uh, believer of, uh, follower of Shoram Karan and Tagore, who, who, who preached school, schooling under the trees amidst nature. He said, you'll have time for the school, I'll teach you at home. But what he taught me at home was so valuable, it still stays with me. Because he took me to the river and taught me swimming. He took me to the village fields. And when we walked on the fields, he, he showed me the poor farmers there. And they would sing when they were harvesting the crop. They would sing when they were planting the paddies, paddies saplings. He said, in a city, a person doesn't sing when he's working as a mechanic in a factory. He doesn't sing, but he sings in the fields. So the farmers sing in joy because their life is with nature. And the, especially the farmers who work on the fields in Malnad, in the rains, in the slush, in the paddy fields, they have got different songs for different seasons. You know, when they're planting, they have, they have a song. When they're um, harvesting, they have a song. When they have a ragi, they grind the ragi, it's called ragi bisapada. They got, they got the different songs for that. And when they were doing some of these work in, in the field, they would pick up, and I would ask him, what is that? They would pick up crabs and put it on one side. They would put greens on the other side. And he said, look, you complain at home. You talk, you, you do not eat on time. You say that it is too hot or it is too cold. Look at them. God compensates them. Because the greens, the spinach, or sopuglu, that's all free. These crabs are free. They've got more nutrition than the food that we eat. There's more nutrition than even chicken or mutton or whatever that we have. And much later, when I, when I went abroad into France, I, I realized, I was vegetarian in those days, I realized that these are, the, these are the biggest delicacies, most favored delicacies, which in India we have even today a kind of prejudice against some kinds of food that people eat. So all these things, you know, gave me a kind of lesson to look at the poor with empathy. So when we were to walk in the village, there is the village saukar like you have in every village. He would never point to the village saukar to me. He would point out the poor people so that I always compared myself to the ones who are less fortunate than me. And therefore, my own childhood was in a sense, poverty, because my father had eight children, he was a school teacher, he had a small patch of land, and his salary, I think, was about 40 rupees. But it was full of sunshine. It was full of sunshine because there was no envy of, or jealousy of looking at the people who are better than you. That was the first and the biggest lesson. And uh, D.B. Gundapa, one of our famous uh, uh, Pitamaha poetry. He says in one poem, Baradihuda Enikenani, Bandihuda Marayadiru, Gurjisu Valitrivudanu, Kedugala Nadwe, Irova Bhagyava Nenadu, Bara Nembudanu Bidu, Harushikade Dari. You know, Yuruva Bhagyava Nenadu, whatever you have in hand, other Nenkondo, Barade Rodana Bitbudu. Tagore, in, in a separate place, he says, if you shed tears when the sun sets, if you shed tears when the sun sets, you will also miss the stars. So you have to learn to be happy and count your blessings. And when I was first joined my school on, the, on my fifth standard, I went to the village and I also noticed that it was the only school for about 20 other villages around 
Guru. And many of the other children, they would come four, five kilometers walking, crossing the river on both sides, coming wet in the uh, rains. And in that sense, I was more fortunate with them. So it, it always, you know, evoked this kind of sympathy for me and empathy that, you know, you are more fortunate with them. You are poor, but my father, even though he was so lowly paid, he always had about eight, ten children whom he used to teach at home. So one day in my seventh standard, the headmaster, Nanjudaya, he said, there is an exam for a military school. Does anybody want to apply for that, uh, apply for that uh, exam? And I was the only child, was small and puny, and I just lifted my hand. And when I came home, I asked my father, what is a military? What does military mean? And he, and I used to notice in the villages, even today you can see, you will have Veera Shaivara Hotel, Brahmanara Hotel, you will have military hotel. And he said, military hotel means people who join the army eat non-vegetarian food. So you can become strong if you eat non-vegetarian, something like that he told me. <laughs> and with that idea of getting away from the village, to go beyond the village, I lifted my hand. There's a very famous poem by Putin Arthimacharya, Kannada poet. He said, Gudiyache, Gedadache, Gadiyache, Hogona, Baniro, Hosanadige. Now, beyond the temple, beyond the woods, beyond the borders, let's go to new lands. Let's discover new lands. But you cannot discover new lands if you are on the shore. You have to leave the shore for a long time to discover new lands. Because a ship is very safe only when it is in the harbor. A ship has to sail and to discover new lands. You know, as you know, it was Columbus who, in a undecked small boat, went and discovered America. Of course, he went to set, set off and discover India, but he went to discover America. And how did it happen? Because he was standing at the edge of Europe. He was standing at the edge of Europe in, in, in Spain, standing on the land and looking at the ocean. And when he was looking at the Atlantic Ocean, the ocean extended, he was standing on the land, and an idea came to him because the earth was then supposed to be flat. It was not known to be round. So he said, if I'm standing on the land, if there's water in front of me, there must be land on the other side. And so he went and asked for funds from his own king in Italy, who did not give him money. Then he went and asked the Spanish kings, who gave him money. So in one sense, he was the first venture capitalist who received money from a Spanish king. The first venture capital came from a Spanish king. We are talking of this. And then he went and discovered India, the Indies, the West Indies, instead of discovering India, and he discovered the Red Indians. And that changed the history of the world, of this ability to dream and venture out onto the high seas. It changed the history of the world because Spain became one of the largest naval powers in the world. The Spanish Armada was the most powerful, most famous, and they went on to colonize half the world, more than the British before that, whole of South, South, uh, whole of South America, they went and colonized. So it is not the wealth of ships that can discover new lands. It is the ability to have adventure combined with dreaming that discovers new lands for you. And similarly, Galileo, he discovered new constellations from the opera glasses in, the, in, in Western Europe even today. If you go to the theater, you get the opera glasses, you know, simple glasses that you can see the stage because if you're sitting in the back, you want to see the actors, how, how they're acting, you get an opera glass. With the opera glasses, Galileo discovered, you know, the, the new constellations and nothing as significant, the, all our telescopes has been discovered since Galileo about 500 years ago. The reason I'm telling this is that we're always complaining. We're always complaining about not having enough resources not having any money, maybe the college and the company where you work, people will always complain, I want more resources. It is not the resources. It is being resourceful that will 
that will get you success. People with a lot of resources, it can be in families, it can be in institutions like this, it can be uh, Sir C.V. Raman discovered and got a Nobel Prize on his effects of light. In those days in the 1930s, in, in spite of all our IITs today and the Indian Institute of Science, we don't have any Nobel Prize from India, but C.V. Raman discovered the future. So it is your ability to dream, your ability to think, uh, 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 and think till it pains, as someone said, that's what gives you, it gives you discovery. C.K. Prahlad, the great management guru said, between great dreams and low resources, or high dreams, high dreams, and a lot of resources. See, so that means we have big dreams, but no resources. That is a better combination than very low dreams, low aspirations, but a lot of resources. So do not complain wherever you are tomorrow when you go into your new fields, that if there are no resources, be resourceful. So I left the village and joined the military school the first time I failed because the exam was in uh, English and I had studied in a Kannada medium school. And um, so I came back and told my headmaster that I could not understand anything. I'm Kannada the Lodi Vini Parishay Divi. English Nali, I did not understand. So that headmaster sitting in that village sent a postcard to Delhi because it was the exam given by the Ministry of Defense. Sent a postcard and put it in the local Gorur post office post box and wrote a letter saying that English is not intelligence, English is another language. If you want to get people from rural areas, military school, then you give an exam in the local language and he forgot about it. After three months again, he came to the classroom. He said, He said, Call me. He said, Come and meet me. He said, Look, they have written back saying that they'll give an exam in Canada. Would you like to go again? So, so I went again, but that was my first lesson that don't take no for an answer. Don't take no for an answer. You have to question on anything that you have held, long held as a permanent belief, it always needs questioning. Regardless of who has told you that, listen to it with humility, but question it with question it with, with the reverence, question it with with a with a with a with a attitude and aptitude to learn. So the first lesson was from the headmaster himself that don't take no for an answer. And then your own mind. You must have that belief in yourself. Self-trust is the first secret to success. The ability to listen to your heart, because to all of us, there is an inner prompting, there is an inner voice, there is a magnetic needle that points to us. There is a particular light that shines to all of us. So, you have to have the heart and the mind to receive that, that signal. And then you have to have the ability to obey that inner prompting. That is what, what is called as intuition. That is intuition. The rest is tuition, what you learn. That tuition is important, as Dr. Swami said. That tuition is important. That's what you get here. And as Mark Twain said, education is what remains after you have forgotten whatever you have learned. True education is what remains after you have forgotten whatever you have learned here. So you have to have the courage to listen to that inner voice of yours. So I went back again to take the exam a second time. And this time it was in Canada and I passed. I joined the military school. So Dr. Suresh was asking about failure. I think what they say said in another place, a, a good hard failure when you are young. A good hard failure 
is the greatest teacher in life. But the thing is, you are not a failure when you fail. You are a failure only when you quit. It's only when you stop trying. You are a failure. So the surest way to succeed is try one more time. It is said of uh, Edison, Thomas Alva Edison, who invented the light bulb. Someone asked him about failure. He said, I did not fail 10,000 times. I did not fail 10,000 times. I learned 10,000 ways in which it does not work. So he said, I discovered 10,000 ways in which it doesn't work. It is the 10,000 first time I got it and I discovered the light bulb. So this, because in life and business, in school and colleges, you will fail. So it is not the failing or it is not the falling that is the glory of man. The glory of man or a woman the glory of a human being is not in never falling because you will always fall. You will always fail. The glory is the art of rising each time you fall. So you will fall. The question is, will you get up? You have to get up each time you fall. That is the art of life and the art of business. And so each time I fell, and I fell many times, I fell a few more times, that I, I would rise again. You would rise again, dust yourself up, keep walking, keep moving. And nothing will succeed in life unless you have enthusiasm. The greatest wisdom of all life is enthusiasm, perennial, continued enthusiasm. Kuvempu and Kada Heltare. Jada Vembu de Illa. Jada Vembu de Illa. Chetana Veyella. Everything is, is not inertia. The whole of life is Chetana. We have, to, we have to be hopeful, we have to be optimistic. And I went to the military school. I was there for four years in Bijapur. Then I went to NDA, National Business Academy, another three years, and another one year to Indian Military Academy, Dehradun. During my training, the Bangladesh war, there was a rumbling of the war. I was then our course was cut short and my course, we went straight to Bangladesh for the Indo-Pakistan Bangladesh war. I was only 20 at that time. And after 15 days, the war was over. And, and war is not a school in generosity. It is not a school that can, that can uh, in, in war, everybody loses. In war, both sides lose resources and people. So some of my friends died. It left a big scar on me. After that, I served in Kashmir, I served in Bhutan, I served in Sikkim. In the interval, Shahad Malay, after eight years, I was about 27, I resigned and I came back to my village. When I resigned, I received 7,000 rupees as my gratuity because I did not put in the pensionable service. In those days, for an IAS, IPS, an army officer, the salary, starting salary was about 600 rupees, which are on a three-day leave. So I was drawing about 1,500 rupees salary. I resigned as a captain of the army. And I did not ask what is it that I wanted to do. But I knew that I did not want to continue anymore in a government job. It was a great life, it was an adventurous life, but I wanted to discover new aspects of life. I traveled the entire length and breadth of India on motorcycle. I did a lot of trekking in the Himalayas. I went trekking in USA, did 10,000 kilometers of uh, trekking in, the, in America. When I came back, I felt the army had given me enough education, enough courage, education of a different sort, and my father had given me good values, and I never felt for a moment 
that I was not nervous as to who will take care of me tomorrow. In Canada, there is a proverb, Vaitro Samana Hiltare when you go, put this down, Hulhakal Venta. He has brought you to this world, he'll take care of you. As long as you work hard, as long as you have Chaitanya, you have optimism. So I came back to my village and I took to farming. Like all farmers, I got into debt. I had a dairy farm, I had bananas, I had poultry, I had silkworm rearing, a whole lot of things. Like all farmers, I got into debt. Then I kept thinking, why are farmers in debt? And why am I in debt? And that deep research or deep thinking got me out of debt eventually because I realized that our input was always, the expenditure was always more than the income. So I took to a lot of innovations. I converted my entire farm into, especially I was doing a lot of silkworm rearing. I converted the entire farm into organic farming. And eventually I came out of debt. I, I didn't become rich, but I was rich in my experience. I came out of it. And one day, after I had, by which time I had got married, I had two children. My wife uh, came to see me in a bullock cart because there was no road to my place. I didn't have a car. And uh, she came with her father and mother and sister to see me in my farm because I didn't have a bungalow. I was living in a tent for about two years. And I said, I'm there, but I've gone there to remove the thorns because it was all barren lands, lands that were given for the lands that were submerged in the dam in, in Gorur. So when you build a dam, a lot of destruction also takes place. About 60 villages, 60 villages were submerged under water. About 100,000 acres of fertile lands were submerged. And also a lot of Forests were submerged along the bank of the river. And what does the government do? Because sometimes dams are built politically. So the government will then rehabilitate these people. So they give land in some other place. When they give land in some other place, they again give land which is forest lands, or they give you which are all barren lands, or they give you gomara, this is the grazing lands. So they gave some 3,000 acres for these three, four villages. So I came back from the army. And I went in a motorcycle and took a village accountant and a boy and walked these five miles and went there and stood on that hill there and saw the land that was allotted to me. And as I stood there on the top of that hill, I, I was dreaming. I was dreaming, you know, a person who dreams and energy as against a person who is timid, a person who is not adventurous. One will see fences and borders. The other one will see possible farms, possible new things that you can build. And I was standing on the soil, took some soil in my hand, and I was overcome this emotion. I, I can now find what I want to do in my life. I can read books. I can be exploring the lands. Can work on the field, and as I was looking at the fields, I was also dreaming, dreaming of my dairy farm, dreaming of my silviculture farm, of my poultry farm, and all those things. Put it into a piece of paper and started implementing on that. And then, because it was not giving me enough income, I said I must do something else. I was on a motorcycle. I had an Enfield bullet motorcycle. I'd gone to Hassan some work. It was getting late. It started drizzling, so I went to the, the local workshop to get my motorcycle repaired. They said the motorcycle dealership is closed. I said, what happened? They said, also he has closed and it's gone. Then sitting on that place, I realized that uh, if this guy has closed shop, then somebody else must, must open there because between Hassan, Kurg, and Chikmanglo, it was uh, uh, Hassan was in the center. It was a rural area. In those days, there were only two motorcycles. 
uh, in south, there was Enfield motorcycle in Java. Both were in uh, south, one was in Chennai, one was in um, uh, Mysore. And the other one was Rajut, which came a little later. So as I was sitting on my bike, it was drizzling, I said, why don't I set up an Enfield motorcycle dealership? So I called another friend of mine who was in Hassan, who had a farm. And, I, and as we were dreaming, I said, look, why don't we set up this dealership? So instead of driving to my farm on the motorcycle, it's a bit risky because the bike was not in good repair. I took a night bus and went straight to Chennai. Same night. Went to Chennai. To some friends, we found the address of the Enfield Motorcycle uh, headquarters. And I walked in there, I still remember. And I told the general manager there, I said, you know, I come from Hassan. I have a bike. I went to get it repaired. It was closed. I heard the shop is closed. Why don't you give me the dealership? He said, you're a farmer, you're an ex-army officer, because normally in those days, if you're a dealer, you're usually a Banya or a Marwadi or a, you know, or a Shetru. That community was the people who were in there. But he said, you do not know anything. And I said, I know one thing. I know how to give good customer service. You're not giving good customer service. You don't even know that the dealership is closed. So give me the dealership. So he, he liked what I said. And on the spot, he gave me the dealership. Suppose if I had waited for an advertisement to come, and then after the advertisement comes, if I had you know, put an advert, put my application, probably I would never have got it. So I think you have to be sometimes listen to that inner prompting, and if you deeply believe in it, you have to have the courage to follow that inner prompting. The said of Napoleon, who's a small army, who beat larger armies is because he said in war it is not cannons that win you war but lightning speed and that is true in business and in true in many of our cases uh, of our life uh, life's journey so he was said to be as prompt as his thoughts you know he he shortened a uh, straight line to reach his point. It's not possible to shorten a straight line. But he said, I will shorten a straight line to reach my destination. So that is the kind of ability to move with speed by listening to your inner prompting. This is not to say that do not analyze. As they say in management, analysis by paralysis. Paralysis by analysis or sudden death by instinct. At least sometimes you do it by instinct. It can cause sudden death. But too much of analysis also is, results in paralysis. So there's a point beyond which analysis cannot go. There's a point that we reach where we have to rely at the end of all the analysis. We have to rely on all your experience, all your this one, and listen to that inner heartbeat of yours. And so we had a Enfield dealership settled. Then to that I had a Luna moped, then I had a Honda scooters, and I had about eight branches. I opened a branch in Hassan, Chikmagalur, and the neighboring um, Taluks, in uh, Indra Patta and various places. I had about eight branches. We had about 60, 70 people. So to, uh, suddenly it occurred to me that there's a great joy in creating jobs. At whatever level, an entrepreneur, C.K. Prahlad said today, entrepreneurs are the new freedom fighters of this country because they create a new market, a, a market which did not exist before. They create a new want, a, 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 a new satisfaction. And in the process, they create jobs. And I think creating jobs is the biggest charity. Then. Along the way, I did various things. Um, sometimes said business doesn't work. Uh, I was, it never stopped me. I never put my head on, uh, in my hands and sat down. My father would say sometimes, you know, you dream, but do not lose yourself and despair. 
You have to lose yourself in action. That's what even the Bhagavad Gita says in a different way, that you have to lose yourself in action. In the very midst of my defeat, I was always thinking of new ventures. At a Udupi hotel for some time, then I found that uh, there was something which I was not in a position to run it after a long, a long time. But each time I found that it was not, so each of them were learning from me. Then, because of my work in farming, uh, over a period of years, in which I did some innovations in silkworm rearing, I got one of the biggest uh, international awards for my silkworm rearing, a global award called the Rolex Award for Enterprise with a big cash prize. So in those days, I became very famous as an agriculturist, and a horticulturist, and a sericulturist. I became the largest silkworm egg producer in India. And that uh, ability to convey to farmers how to reduce their losses, like I did by converting your farm into a low-cost farm. In one sense, my low-cost airline, I think the idea came probably from my farm. Because, for example, people in sericulture will know and you put a building in RCC or tiles, you have to spend, let's say, you know, in those days, uh, two lakh rupees to put a building for a silkworm rearing shed or a poultry shed. But instead of RCC or tiles, if you have thatch, then your cost comes down. You can have a larger number of birds or larger number of silkworm eggs. So it reduces cost. But what is more important, what is low cost is also eco-friendly. Because when you put thatch, it is warm in winter, it is cool in summer, and that's what the silkworms want. And that's what the poultry birds want. So I converted all my sheds into thatch sheds. Uh, did not have windows because all that cost money. But that also turned out to be very beneficial from the point of view of agriculture. Anyway, now I came to Bangalore because my children were growing up and I wanted to put them to school. My coconut plantation has started yielding. I still have the farm. And I moved to Bangalore to, uh, by which time I had established a agriculture and irrigation, micro-irrigation design and consultancy farm, consultancy company in Bangalore with a branch in uh, Mysore and Hassan. And I came to Bangalore and at that time I, was in the army club in Bangalore, going for my tennis and squash in the evenings and mornings. And I met an old friend of mine, a buddy of mine, who was also in the army with me, who was a helicopter pilot. And every time I used to come and meet him, he said he was looking for a job. He was not getting a job. And that happened over a period of five to six months. He had resigned. He was still 38, 39, or 40 he was. He had three children. He was an outstanding uh, pilot. He was a gallantry award winner. He was a great leader. He was a lieutenant colonel in the army. But he was not getting a job. And he said, I'm looking for a job. And, and the other time, I also was chosen by the government to visit China with a delegation of farmers uh, to study sericulture, silicon rearing. China is, China, if say, invented silk as we know it. Those days, there used to be death penalty if you smuggled out any cocoon because they were protecting it. But uh, now it's been seen that probably India had silk as early as China itself. In China, it's about 2,000 years old. And Mahanjadaro and other places, they have discovered traces of silk. And the uh, silk in Karnataka itself it was popularized by Tipu Sultan, uh, what we call the Kolega silk and the Mysore silk, that itself is about 1,000 years old. So when, when I was in Bangalore, I went there to China alone. And when I was there, I suddenly found that there was a brochure in the hotel there in China, which had a, become a communist, which was a communist country which had embraced capitalism already in 1995. Total capitalism, in, you know, except in political ideology, it was a communist country. And so I was uh, in the hotel and there was a brochure there which said, if you want to invest in China, single window agency. 
So that was like, shocking for me because India was a democracy, but we had a socialistic pattern. We had you know, Air India was uh, um, uh, the government. Tata Steel was there, but most of the other things were all nationalized. And China had become totally a capitalist economy. And uh, that then the idea came to me that China had embraced capitalism. The Russian state had collapsed. And Nassim Rao had just started the reforms um, in 96, 97. And I felt that as, as a kind of a trend, that I felt that India cannot remain in isolation. That India has to liberalize. There will be only, today, even today we fight elections on caste, but somehow I get a, got a feeling that there will be only one caste in the future, the consumer's caste. Though these underlying castes are there during elections, there's only one caste, the consumer caste will push the reforms. And I go to a hotel, you sit on an airplane, you do not know what are the caste of the person who is serving you. You do not know the caste of the person who is uh, serving you the food the caste of the pilot who is flying the plane. You do not know the caste of the mechanic who comes and does the repair. And in silkworm rearing itself, I had realized the person who grows the, uh, grows the silkworms is a farmer. The farmers are usually Gaudas, Hindus. The uh, reeler who reels the uh, cocoon in Ramnagram is a Muslim. And the weavers are Hindus. And the person who takes the saris is a Marwadi. So it's all castes which come together to be able to get a sari to a lady or to a gentleman to wear it. As very ejected as a sari is, that's how a silk is also made. There's a warp and weft, there's jerry there, there's warp there, there's weft there. And a society is like that. So I realized that India now cannot remain in isolation. So I came back with this idea and suddenly it flashed on me that we had a country which is on the way to reforms. There is China which has become a capitalist country. But on the other hand, we didn't have a single helicopter company in South India, not one. There are only about five, six helicopter companies. They were belonging to the Birlas, and the old world business people and the thoppers, there was no private sector helicopter that could get a taxi. And I said, I must make the helicopter available to the people more easily than it was possible. And with hundreds of pilots from the Army, Air Force, and Navy without jobs, I said, I can't go wrong. There are pilots without jobs. There's no helicopter company. India is on the way to reforms. And I said, I'm starting a helicopter company. I did not know, fortunately, how much does a helicopter cost. We had a small site, my friend and I, we mortgaged it. But the value of that site would not even get you two blades of a helicopter. But the fact that the, the dream came to me and to my friend. So before I announced this to him, after I came back from China, he came and told me that he has got a job. I was very happy. I said, where did you get your job? He said, I, I got a job as a security officer, in an administrative officer in a company. So I was shocked because I said, I was an outstanding pilot, an army officer, still young, but had become a security officer. Then I told him, why don't we start a helicopter company? Why don't you resign your job? And he left it. And one day suddenly he came to my office, my agriculture office. He said, Gopi, how come? So I said, okay, have a tea. And he was not leaving. He said, why aren't you leaving? I got to do my work. He said, I resigned my job. So that's how the helicopter company came into being. But he was looking after the operations and I was going to look after the uh, business because he had no experience in business, by which time I had done seven, eight businesses, failed in many of them, started new businesses, failed it and failed in that again. Again, and each of them was a big lesson for me how not to do things. It's also a lesson for me how to manage people. And I realized one thing. You know, if Gandhi, if millions of people followed him, he never offered any money. 
if Napoleon went on war, people became cannon fodder and joined the army to invade another country. Mao Zedong, when he did the long march, a million Chinese, you know, joined in the march, all for an idea. So people will join you for an idea if you're able to sell your dream to them. But it cannot be a hollow dream. You yourself have to be become one with the dream in a very Vedantic way. You and your dream must become one. You cannot be two separate entities. You have to have an obsession to the point of madness that nothing else, you do not see the obstacles, you only see the light. That is the kind of identification you should have with your objective. And the most important thing was to get my friend, Captain Samuel, to join me because he already had a job now and he was now going to join me and start a new venture. And we had no money, we had no resources except the idea. But as I said, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, always. The journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. So we took the first step and we formed a company. That was in 1995. And from 95 till 97 September, it took us two years and nine months, almost three years to get a license. As you know, this country, it's called License Raj. It is uh, full of uh, corruption. It is there now. It was there yesterday. It was there a thousand years ago. Purandara Dasa said, Satyavanta Rigaidu Kalavalla. That means it is, life has been like that. But, but you, you have to believe in yourself. That I am not going to bribe. Of course, if you have money, it will be a shortcut. Somebody will sometimes take the money and you will not, your job is not done. But as I say, a fool and his money are soon parted. So your money is gone. The job is not done. But often, your money gets done and a lot of people, if you go with a suitcase to Delhi, somebody will take your suitcase and do your job at a short time. But we had no money and we had decided not to drive. But it took us three years. As Vivekananda said, stop not till your goal is reached. We never had a thing that I'll try for six months. If it doesn't work, Sam, Captain Sam didn't say I'll go back to my job. I didn't say if it doesn't work, I'll leave this and go. I said, no, we will not stop. We'll keep going. So this, this ability to hold down to, to your dream is not enough to dream. It has to be your commitment. I think you are, your, your limitation is your ability to commit to the dream. That is your limitation. The ability to dream big and the ability to commit to the dream. That is your handicap. So if you are determined, as Emerson said, the universe conspires to make it happen. In that way, I am very superstitious. The harder you work, the luckier you get. So three years we went. When we go to Delhi, those days we would go by train, we would stay in uh, officers' messes or friends' houses, but we could not afford to stay in the hotel. And eventually at the end of three years, we got a license, but it was only one line. He said, the government has no objection for you to start an airline. But it took us three years just to get that one line uh, letter. Then, uh, now we had the license, we had the Captain Sam, only one employee, me as second employee. Then I had to get other pilots and engineers. So I had, as I said, that we had pilots and whatever India did not have, but India had one thing. It had a market. It had no competition because there was no the helicopter. There were helicopters for their own use. Birla had a helicopter for himself. And when he was not using it, he was giving it to politicians. So there was no helicopters for consumers. They were not consumer dependent. So since there were no helicopters for consumers, and I was the only one starting for consumers, for customers, I felt I have no competition. I think sometimes these kind of ideas that will strike you when you're going for a walk in the morning or when you're having a bath or when you're swimming, these ideas are important because 
and he's telling a genius is nothing but the capacity to take infinite pains. Genius is nothing but the capacity to take infinite pains. And it is your ideas. Many times you say, oh my God, I thought of it. You, all of you read in the newspaper. And some of you who are entrepreneurial will say, yes, this idea came to me. But no. So this idea came to me, but it is your own ideas. It is your own ideas coming back to you with the alienation, alienated majesty. You see somebody else's idea coming back to you because you did not act on it. You did not listen to your own uh, heart. So at the end of three years, we had the license. Then I took three, four other pilots. I said, would you like to leave the army and join me? I'm starting a, a aircraft company. But we never promised them a moon. We said, this is a great adventure. Would you be like to part of the adventure? And as I said, if people could join Mao Zedong or Gandhi, one is, one is a violent march where, you know, they went to create a revolution. In another, is a peaceful march with Gandhi where millions of people joined. Then you should also be able to get people for a lower salary. When you start earning, they believe in your dream and follow you like a messiah. And I got some pilots and I got some engineers who are also ready to leave the comfort of their homes. And uh, But I, with all that, I still didn't have a helicopter. I got the license, I got this. And I went to the chief minister's office here. I wanted a place for the helicopter. And there is one more airfield in Bangalore before the international airport or Jakur Airport, which is still there, where our helicopter company is still there. And uh, so I went to the chief minister at that time, it was J.H. Patel, as I said before, there is corruption. But, but you cannot become cynical. There are good people, always, even amongst politicians, even amongst bureaucrats. For every 10 guy who is corrupt, there's the 11th guy who is not corrupt. And we all know the politicians are corrupt, the bureaucrats are corrupt. And they're good bureaucrats. They're also victims of the system. The politician is you in the mirror. Politician is come from us, he's from our society. So you cannot be cynical. Cynicism is a slow suicide. So I never went to a middleman to say, I'm get chief minister, we have meetings, Kursi. No, I did not. I sought a meeting with the chief minister, Mr. J. S. Patel. I went there. I told him I can put the helicopter in Bangalore, or I can put it in Hyderabad, or I can put it in Chennai, because by which time liberalization had started and states were competing to get investments because politicians knew that all that, whatever caste politics they may do, that they cannot win an election if they do not create jobs. So they started getting investment because state government, all the state government undertakings were under loss. No jobs are getting created. Even today when you go on the road, there are people who are selling selling things to you. Somebody selling you sunglasses, somebody selling you um, caps, somebody selling you car uh, screens. Whole lot of things they are selling. They are not begging. They may be doing a parity. You know, once you know, and somebody came and said, Sir, I saw it, my, my book only, Pirate. Yeah. Would you like to buy a book? So they, but they are selling. They are not begging. So the, the country has this ability to produce people. In spite of all these things, there will be good people. So you need to have the generosity of spirit. To admire good things. And I say good things, not only good people, there's good music, there's good people who have done a lot of sacrifices, there are good bureaucrats. Somebody or the other, like the Krishna just gave Draupadi that tari, somebody will come and help. But if 10 doors shut, the 11 door will open. So this is the first thing that J.H. Patel told me. There are some janta there. And you know some, all of us that these parties are corrupt. He says, I said, I can go to Chennai, I can go to Hyderabad, I can go put the helicopter in Bangalore. Why can't we make Bangalore like Singapore? We already have HAL here, we have BL here. He said, what do you want? I said, I want an acre of land in Jakur to put my helicopter. 
And um, he said, not only will I, will I give you the land, I will also use your helicopter. He said, because my helicopter is going to be a new one. On the phone, he called his secretary and said, send that helicopter to HAL for repairs. Then let it take their own time. I'm going to use Tekken's helicopter. And finally, he got the funding. And what is funding? One funding way is that you go and borrow money from the bank. But nobody will give you money because I don't have a balance sheet. I'm not rich. I don't have property to mortgage. So nobody will give you money. But how do you get money? The other way of getting money, because the world has been changing, like I told you what Columbus did, Columbus has an idea, an idea to discover new lands. He has courage, he had people who are ready to follow him to death. And he had a boat, but he went to the king. One king said no, his own king said no, he didn't believe in the idea. The Spanish king of another country gave him money and funded this venture. So if you have an idea, and if you believe in that idea, and if you're ready to sacrifice yourself for that idea, that means you take the lowest salary, or you do not take salary. So we had not taken any salary for three years. And I put the lowest salary for myself. Now you forgot everything, but you still don't have money. And capital will come to you. It was true yesterday, it's true today, and it's true tomorrow. Your energy, and your passion, and your commitment, and your enthusiasm, is more important than capital. Capital will come to you. If the river goes to the sea, capital will find you. But you have to sacrifice everything that you have for that. So after we got all these things, we got a gentleman, because we went to the venture capitalists in those days. Venture capital was very less in India. They said we'll only put venture capital, it was very advanced in America, but we'll only put venture capital into IT. This was in 95, 96, and there was one gentleman, who was an uneducated gentleman, who was a rich man, and he came like a godfather. He said, I'm going to put some money, not big money, and he put a small amount of money. And that small amount of money, some 20 lakhs that he put, he sold for 140 crores when Edekin became a big company. After the end of 10 years, his 20 lakhs became 145 crores. That is the power of an idea. So we got some money. Then I got a helicopter from a Japanese company. Because you always think, you know, America is a company, country which gives you all these things. When it so happened, there was a Japanese company who I came across who gave me a helicopter. And just when he had sent a letter to me that uh, we will give you the helicopter one line, they'll be happy to give you the helicopter. Within one month, I got a letter because the government in India fell. There was no government in India for about 100 and odd days. And uh, because there was instability, the previous government fell and there was no government. And Devagoda then became a prime minister. And when Devagoda became a prime minister, there was a global crisis in, in, in South Asia. So all the helicopters in South Asia, because of the appreciation of the dollar, South Korea, in North Korea, sorry, South Korea, in Thailand, in Malaysia, Indonesia, all these aircrafts were on the ground. So these people contacted me again. And I said, there is nothing more useless than an aircraft on the ground. You've got 55 aircraft sitting on the ground. Give one. So he said, fine. And he came and he gave us one helicopter. So for an entrepreneur, you have to be optimistic. You know, that optimism, a person who wants certainty, if you want all obstacles to be overcome, then no venture can start. If all obstacles had to be overcome, at some point, you have to jump. Like a bird in a nest, when it jumps out of the nest, it does not know how to fly. It jumps out. No bird teaches flying on the ground, like we teach pilots, for example. The bird jumps out of the nest. So it, it discovers its wings. It discovers its songs in the air. So you have to be like that bird. At some point, you have to jump out of that nest. Because security 
is mortal's chief enemy. You know, we always talk of, you know, having security. I think security is the biggest enemy of humankind. If you look at history, the last 2000 years, it has never been secure. There's been pestilences, wars, throughout history, from Ashoka's time, when the Mughals came, kings fought amongst each other, then the British came. Now we had a Pakistani war, we had the Chinese war, you have a Ukraine war, all of there's always insecurity. But there, are, there is no security, but there are opportunities. And India is all gates and all opportunities. So at the end of three years, we started with one helicopter and we flew the first helicopter in Bangalore. So when nature adds difficulty, when nature adds difficulty, it adds brains. When you have, uh, if you have will, you will get new eyes. And the Hasa Drishti, you will get a, not only Antar Drishti, a, a Dura Drishti. What is Dura Drishti? There's a vision. You need to have a vision, like your own institution. Whosoever thought 60, 70 years ago that he'll create an institution like this. So somebody needs to have that vision. But vision is the art of seeing the invisible. Vision under an order. But it is the art of seeing the invisible. What is the invisible? Invisible is the future. As an entrepreneur or as a person who is a dreamer, you want to become a scientist, you want to become, I'm not saying everybody should become an entrepreneur or an institution builder. You have to see the invisible and the invisible is the future. And you have to create that future yourself. It's not enough to write the software, you have to script the software of your future. Uh, as uh, your, your life is not made by destiny, your life is made by choice. And we often hear people saying, okay, connection illa, political connection illa, dud illa, illa kade mosa. Even recently, I know one pilot who kept coming, he kept failing. One of my people in my company, he applied for an exam and his father would come, sir, or he'll fail out of the I asked him to try again. He said, I can call somebody and influence a little bit in uh, interview, but he has to pass the exam because you're joining an airline. Nobody wants to compromise on safety. So he said, let him try again. He tried again, again he failed. He tried again, again he failed. I said, keep trying. You pass and then come to me. So finally he passed. And he said, before he passed last time, just about three, uh, four days ago, he said, Tumba corruption is there, or Allah set up it is there, other law. I said, Yes, there will be some five, six percent corruption. Even if you get through now, it is corruption because I have given my influence, which is okay. But 90 percent get through without without uh, without corruption. I'm sure I'm sure many of you know. Some of you may have come with the influence with the management, but 90 percent of you have come on your own merit, and that will always be there. So uh, you know, it is uh, at Arist there are two famous uh, sayings choice, not chance. Choice and not chance determines your destiny. You know, I'm not what happened to me, I'm what I choose to become. Because we always say, Sarabdha, Drachara, fate, which is there, we all know. But still, it is. Our choice that determines your destiny. It is what you choose to become. It is not what because of past events what you have become. It is uh, uh, you, you are not what happened to you. But you are what you choose to become. So we started this helicopter company, and uh, uh, within a matter of about five years, we had about uh, 18, 19 helicopters, and also small planes. And during that period, during that period when I was running the helicopter company and uh, the small aircrafts, uh, I was getting a lot of phone calls, sometimes from ministers, saying that we read in the paper that your helicopter is going, can we go to Hubli? Can we go to Vijayawada? Can we go to Rajabandri? And the minister, I remember Chandra Babu Naidu would say, Captain, no helicopter is okay for me, but uh, why don't you do a helicopter flight from Hyderabad to Rajbandri. I would tell him, no. 
it will not work because the helicopters cost, even if uh, you give some subsidies cost, it, people can't afford it. That's when this buzz was in me. I was not able to see it, I was not able to touch it. But suddenly, one day I found there was a new India. It was a story of my life, the story of Edekan. It's a story of new India, India of possibilities. And this life is all about possibilities, that you can make it happen. So I was driving to my farm, and on the ways, sometimes, I got down because I saw a board there, computer school. This was in uh, 2001, 2002, computer school in Chandrapat, Shtadamun. So I stopped there, I went inside, there's a small 20 by 20 bed, and there was one guy who was hanging at one uh, uh, laptop or a, a, a computer, and he said, what are you doing here? He said, the school on the look, so I'm teaching uh, computers for the students here. So that informed me that there's a new India that is coming up, a new India. And it was not the same India. I could touch it, I could feel it. And when you go to the village, if you go to somebody's house in the Taluk headquarters, in their house, they would have a refrigerator. Not everybody, one in the village. Because he wanted to show that he has a refrigerator. And when I was flying in the helicopter, when I used to come on the villages, I would find dish antennas on the, on the uh, villages. And I did not know the dish antenna. Wherever I went, I could find mirrors reflecting. So I said, let's fly down. When I came there, I found there were dish antennas. Some entrepreneur in the village collected 1,000 rupees from 20 people, 20,000 rupees, and bought a big 15 feet dish antenna, and then gave cable connection. And when I go to the village, I could see in that village on the ground, so I had a helicopter view and I had a worm view, you know, a view of an insect. When I go into the village, I could see there were farmers who had come back from work. All of them are sitting outside. And the one farmer in that house, village, or ten farmers in the village have got uh, uh, television. They were sitting and watching. You know, the, by which time already for about 150 rupees, you were having about eight nine channels in Canada. You had Canada news channel, Canada movie channel, Canada music channel. It's a different country. And what were they seeing in between that? They were seeing advertisement, advertisement for motorcycles, advertisement for Fair and lovely creams, because uh, even in the villages, people started uh, buying creams, uh, toothpaste. Uh, it was a new country, because in the village, I remember when I went the other day in my own house, we would use Nanjan good tooth powder. And now, uh, the villages, even till recently, when I was in the farm, they were using uh, nim stick, or they were using charcoal and salt. There was no toothpaste. Now, people were buying the toothpaste. So, it is a new country, is there? New consumer wave that had come up. But what I noticed was that they were buying everything but air tickets. That's when I felt it was a new country. It was not a country of a billion people to be fed and subsidized because our country was always, we were under subsidies from America. There was a wheat subsidy, there was a PL480 subsidy, rice was getting imported. We were getting subsidies. So when you say, Give me subsidy, give me aid, you are a poor country. But when you say I'm a person, I want to buy toothpaste. I want you know, that means you have a billion, not poor people, but you are a billion consumers. When you say there are a billion customers, then you are a powerful country. So if you say I want to buy an aircraft, as against give me an aircraft in aid, you know, when you say I want to buy an aircraft. Then Rolls Royce and Boeing and Airbus will stand in front of your door. This I had already noticed in the helicopter. And I said, I want to buy a helicopter. HL did not come to me. I was telling them what is the difference between the government sector. But somebody in Singapore flew down because he saw in the newspaper that Captain Gopinath is starting a helicopter company. In 95, there's a newspaper item. I'm starting a helicopter company. So somebody in Singapore who was the headquarters for Bell helicopter. Singapore is a small city. You throw a stone, it falls into the sea. Such a small city. But all the headquarters for Rolls Royce and Pratt Whitney and Boeing and Airbus was in Singapore. It was not in India. He came to me from Singapore to meet me. 
let me invest in a hotel. And he said, I heard you are starting a uh, helicopter company. I want to sell a helicopter. If I can't sell, I'll give you a used helicopter. And that's how I got the helicopter. So that means they look at you differently with respect. There are billion people, but billion hungry consumers. They're not billion hungry people to be fed, but billion hungry consumers. As C.K. Prahala said, there's wealth in the bottom of the pyramid. These uh, little drops make an ocean. And then I announced, I was in USA flying on a flight and next to me was sitting uh, a big guy uh, in, in, uh, in West, shorts and big tattoos on all the arms. And uh, it was in 2002 and he was eating burgers. And I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a carpenter. I said, yeah. I said, how many times do you fly in a year? He said, I take uh, one long vacation and two short vacations. And his family and his kids were all behind. I said, even today, if there is a nuclear power plant, there is another factory, if there is a machinery which is broken down, who needs to be there first? Is there an officer, is an IAS officer should go there first? Or should the mechanic go first? So the mechanic should go first because he can repair that machine. He is more valuable. But what happened in India was that the officers will go by plane, the minister will go by plane, the guy who is most important on, on whom the economy works, on whom the engine depends, he will go by train, he will come after three days. And your aircraft, if it is prepared, it will get grounded. If the factory is producing cars, that will be grounded. So I said, our nurses, of course doctors, our nurses, our clerks, our carpenters, our they must fly. And I gave a slogan, every Indian must fly. Your vision must be such, it cannot be that I'll make it the largest helicopter company in India, I'll make it uh, 100 aircraft, no. Your vision must be something which cannot be realized, but can be realized every day. Every day you should be able to realize the vision. So I said, every Indian must fly. And that's how we decided on uh, uh, starting an airline. And because now I had already learned a little bit, burnt my fingers, by which time I knew how to handle some of the politicians. And I went to Delhi. I said, I want to start an airline, an airline for the common people. When the idea is powerful, then instead of red tape, it becomes red carpet. Every officer in the department, every clerk will push your file a little faster because it became a people's airline. So in 2003, exactly one year after I announced, we started the Air Deccan airline. And uh, we were selling tickets when we started at one third the price because the Bangalore Delhi flight in those days, every flight, because there are only three airlines Sahara, Air India, and Jet Airways, every ticket was 12,500. So if a husband, wife, and two kids want to go to Delhi and come back, that was one lakh rupees. It was not affordable even for the rich, only the super rich. So people who are traveling by air were largely government servants and largely large corporate companies who had to send people. But what the economy thrives only if the, if the large population, they, they become consumers. You, know, you need to have farmers, you need to have mechanics, they have to, even today, why the Indian economy fails when the rains fail is because 50% of the uh, economy is farmers. And if that 50% of the economy, along with it, the laborers, if they don't buy things, then the economy collapses. You need that economic activity from the bottom of the pyramid to reach the top. You need to have very small poor people, very small rich people, and 90% must be the middle class. That is the engine of the economy. And we, we, we felt that it was not happening. Otherwise, what is happening is they're only going to get people from Jet Airways passengers to Deccan. And I said, we will not compete with the, with the planes. We will compete with the trains because 
India had only about 13 million people traveling by air a year in 2002. 13 million, that is 1.3 crores. As against 18 million traveling by train every day. Plus tra people traveling in bus, another maybe 30, 40 million. So you have to get people from the train to the place. And the way to do it is your business model has to be born of this mud. It's engineers and pilots, innovation from here. And that's how we created a new model where we eliminated all middlemen and used technology by putting all the tickets on the internet, various other innovations. I won't go into it. You can read it in my book. And we started ADECAN. And within four years, ADECAN became the largest airline in the country with 48 aircraft. We deployed 48 aircraft in 48 months. But two things we did, which changed and brought a revolution. One was the lowest ticket. That was possible because, because the model had to be low cost. And what is low cost model is that there is a culture. That means when you leave the room, you switch off the lights, even if you are rich. If you leave the bathroom, switch off the tap. That is the culture. But also there is innovation. Innovation that brings the cost down. One simple innovation, instead of selling the ticket through middlemen, through travel agents who take away 20%, if you put all the tickets on the internet, and make you make the customer directly by the internet, you have straight away eliminated cost of 20%. The tickets become 20% cheaper. And if you then put the eliminate food, for example, we are having 10 million passengers. If you give one water bottle to each passenger, that is 50 crores at 5 rupees. So, Five crores a, a rupee for just water, but you can't give one wat one water bottle. You take two, and the pilot gets on. He will also put some in his pocket. When the aerostats gets on, she will also take some. And when you are getting down on the plane, you will take one or two into your bag. Then the cleaners, everybody, so it becomes a free for all. And so you have to cut costs everywhere through innovation. So instead of spending money, that became income for us. So we were earning as against spending some. 40, 50 crores a year on food, we are earning about 35, 40 crores from passengers by giving the lowest way because somebody will say, I'll not buy water. I'll not buy breakfast on the flight. And I'll eat at home and come or I'll pack something in the house. So what you would do in a, in a, in a train sometimes. And that's how we built the airline. But uh, Dr. Suresh was asking, uh, how do you get people to join you? In Edekin, it became a cult. Edekin became a cult. Because the dream was bigger than the individual. The dream was something that everybody felt they must participate in the dream. Even the customers. Whenever we had any problems, a lot of ideas would come from customers because the customers felt it was their airline. They would write to me and say, I at the boarding card, my email was there, so I could see the customer's response. And I would see every customer's response. They would give you ideas, saying that there's wastage here. Some pilots who are not in the airline, they would give me ideas. I was standing in the airfield, I watched your aircraft land, you know, it consumes more fuel. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. So ideas get generated in the people. And uh, of course, we had a lot of uh, obstacles, you know. A lot of difficulties. It was not easy. It all seems easy the way I say it. In fact, on my inaugural flight from Hyderabad to uh, Vijayawada, we had a fire on the aircraft. All the TV channels were there. And Chandra Babu Naidu, Chief Minister, was there, Civil Asian Minister was there, Rudy, Enkai Naidu was there, and the President. As the aircraft was taxiing, it caught fire. So the flight had to be aborted. So all the TV channels were flashing. The low cost airline is unsafe. The low cost airline is unsafe. And so immediately the minister said, We are with you. Don't panic. So they are good people. The minister, and then Venkai and I told the minister in front of me, If Aidekan fails, Indian aviation fails. Support him. And the first question the TV asked me was, 
or you were going to stop the airline because you had a fire. And then somebody sent me a message and um, thinking it was from my head office, I looked at it, it said, it says, Sir, you are a Binky Pitre, you are a good man. You are a in my Shuru Mano, a Kelsadali. It says, Good woman. <laughs> Though I don't, you don't have to believe it, I don't believe in it. But you know, there were people who want, he said, Don't stop. So I said, He who, walk, he who walks stumbles. Nadiyomano, Nadiyomano. Nadiyomano. So I said, They're not going to stop. I went to the pilot who was one of the best pilots in India. He was a test pilot uh, who test flew the first uh, aircraft in India, light combat jet, uh, Captain Kotial. I asked him, is there any issue with the aircraft? The aircraft had come flying from France, 6,000 kilometers. Nothing had happened. There was some small amount of fuel residue outside the aircraft, below the engine, that heat of the Hyderabad and the fan of the rubber prop caught fire outside. But people panicked, there was smoke. He said, sir, aircraft is fine, I, I'll fly, he said. If you fly, I'll fly. Then after two hours, he did the flight. And uh, as I say, the rest was history. We became the largest airline. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Suresh asked me, you know, it is when you nurture a baby, you get very emotionally attached to it. It's your baby. You have brought it up. And when sometimes you want to sell the baby, you want to part with it, or you sold it. So many people ask me that. I won't get into that long story, but I want to tell that uh, in one uh, meeting, the shareholders, they said so we have invested. A lot of people, a lot of big companies had invested in Deccan because it became a powerful brand. The market cap of Deccan became 4,000 crores. But before that, the early days, they said, Captain, what happens to our money? We have put our money, you know, somebody is a bank manager, somebody is a lecturer, somebody is a clerk. I put, you know, 5,000 rupees and I bought your share. When will I get my returns? When will my 5,000 become 20,000? And also in my company, I had private equity investors. As I told you, I didn't have money. What I did was I sold my dream. And an entrepreneur, when you sell a dream, what does it mean? It means that you don't have money, you have the dream, you have the talent, somebody puts the money and to him you give the shares. Because he bought into your dream. He gives the shares. So my shares will come down. And uh, like even in Narayan Murthy's Infosys case, they have only 3% or 4%. But his 3% is about 6,000 crores today. But he started with 10,000 rupees. So our shares had got reduced. We had private equity people. The oil prices went up. All the airlines were losing money. But Deccan had become the largest airline. So my private equity player said, Captain, we want to exit because we have put public money in the airline. We want to sell and exit because we want to give return to our shareholders who have put money in our company. And uh, of course, it was not easy to say yes because I knew that if I had said no, they would not have been able to do anything unless they had to remove me. It would have become ugly and they, they didn't want to do it. They said, you continue to run it, but we want to sell and go. And then I also thought that if people have put faith in me and put money, I should not, you know, let my ego become bigger than the interests of the other people. And I was also conscious of this common people who had also put money. So I said yes, and then the airline uh, was Jamalia invested in the company, and then you know I got diluted. And unfortunately, Jamalia today is in bad shape. Uh, he did not cheat me or rob me, but he robbed me of my dreams. But the dreams uh, live on. The airline model is there. And uh, today, even today, you can go to Delhi uh, for about six thousand rupees or seven thousand rupees. No, it may not be one rupee because they are not following that model. I wish they do it because that will trigger a implosion in society. The entrepreneurs. It's your job not to just build a product. You have to not only build a product, you have to be in the forefront of changing the consumer behavior. You have to, you have to change the consumer behavior. So one way of doing that was that if I put a one rupee ticket, if I go to Hubli where nobody is going, or to Gwalior where nobody is going, or Bandari where nobody is going, 
and i don't need to advertise because we put a one rupee ticket because in the, whatever you do in every flight not all seats are full there will always be some tickets some seats which are empty don't take it empty because even if you buy a one rupee ticket he'll come back at 2000 rupees even if you buy a one rupee ticket then he'll buy uh, snacks there then he'll get used to it next time he'll not get a one rupee ticket somebody else will get a one rupee ticket and he'll buy a 2000 rupees ticket the idea is the plane should not go empty the plane should be filled so that is possible with the with the art and science science in that sense there is a software which helps you fill it because people sitting in new york people sitting in a village can buy a ticket it was not possible till they can came in because we introduced e ticketing for the first time and that's how we were able to um, change the this uh, model because you had to get the dreams into the a billion hearts they had to believe in your dream that they can drive and so happened uh, uh, that when i went to andamans where we started the flight in the barber shop i found there was a picture of aidekan there and the barber told me the, the barbers association there they all got together and uh, pulled some money and then flew to chennai and back and i know many times in deccan when we started this one rupee ticket many of them had no work because if there's a laborer today of course there are security guards who are going to assam in bihar cooks who are going to assam bihar in an ticket but in those days even if you give a one rupee ticket to a laborer where will he go what will he do in delhi but many people who couldn't afford may not be laborers they would go for the joy of flying that get a one rupee ticket get it i remember once there were small business people about 10 of them they came with me to the inaugural calcutta flight 10 of them had bought these tickets all for 1 rupee 500 rupees they just landed in calcutta and then after half an hour they came back again so um, i think i have covered uh, most of the things that you wanted me to speak about but at the end of what i want to say is that uh, we are always talking about the golden age of course for any country the, the, the golden age is always the past we talk about vijayanagara empire we talk about talk about ashoka we talk about our when today many people keep sending you messages hinduism or like that we had pushpak vima which is all fine of course it was glorious at one time in that period 2000 years ago our technology in in uh, iron casting bronze casting in medicine was and drainage system 2000 ago it was better than the west but we all know today that this huge poverty huge uh, inequality a lot of wealth created along with that there's a huge poverty you can see it in bangalore you can see it in bombay you can see it in the villages we still get, don't get uh, running water inside your tap 150 years ago people would get running water in the tap today you don't get running water in any when you rich up poor corporation brings water if you are a poor man you have to dig a hole in front of your house and lift it from there because the water level doesn't come to your small house and if you are in an apartment the water comes into the pump then you have to buy water from a tank and then you have to pump it up you don't have running water which is not the case in the in the west from the last 150 years so we have a long way to go a huge uh, impoverishment malnutrition uh, infant mortality school dropouts that number is also high so india has huge number of billionaires and billionaires but also it has the largest number of poor people largest number of illiterate people largest number of malnourished people but in spite of all that whatever india may not have it has an inexhaustible market it has an inexhaustible market you can you can never complete that market uh, satisfaction there are people in every level it's coca cola if you see how many people consume coca cola here compared to america only 10% see a tickets only 4 even today only 4% are eating on anything that you see india has a huge market so the golden age for india is not behind us the golden age for india is ahead of us and all of you can work hard dream big and 
and work towards making India a golden age for the future and remove all the imbalances and inequalities that we have in society. Thank you very much. I think I spoke a little too long. Any questions? So maybe because of a shortage of time, we will allow only two questions. The question should be short. Okay. I think we'll wind up then. Have any question? Questions. Myself, actually, I escaped from Churana College. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity, JSS College. And uh, I would like to ask uh, about uh, how to get self motivated ourselves uh, in our life, sir. That's what I said till now. <laughs> no, sir. Sometimes I feel like I, I don't get self motivated, sir. I think, uh, firstly, you have to, as I said again and again, you please listen to your heart as to what you, it you want to do. Because as you said that if you love your job, if you love your job, you don't have to work a day in your life. It's a well-known saying. You will get inspired by others. You get inspired by others by looking at other people. Maybe Narayan Murthy, maybe Kiran Mazumdar, maybe Gandhi, maybe anybody. You can get inspired. No, the, you know, you can get inspired. But ultimately, you have to follow your own dreams. You have to you have to beat your own new path. Somebody has done something, but that doesn't mean you follow him. You get only inspired. And uh, that's the reason I said that you know you have intuition and you have fusion. You need a guru, but after that, you have to beat a new trail. You have to discover and be adventurous yourself by asking yourself, what is it you want to do? It could be you want to um, set up an NGO where you want to work with poor people, but then you have to ensure that you earn money. So you have to find a vocation that you love, that is passionate about. That is the first secret to success. You have to, you have to love what you're doing. Success is the second part. The money is the second part. Money should be the consequence of your journey. As I said, it's better to uh, travel than arrive. You, you must enjoy the journey. And if you enjoy the journey, if you enjoy working hard, automatically results will follow. So you have to ask yourself, what is it you want to do? And do it. You have to have the courage to do what you think you should, you should be wanting to do. Okay, thank you. So proceed to the next. Thank you, sir. Your words and deeds have inspired many of the young minds to achieve more. Thank you, sir, for making us realize that we should always count our blessings and be resourceful. And uh, uh, like, your life has clearly shown that failures is when we quit and not when we uh, fail. Thank you so much for that, sir. I now request the conveners of today's event to felicitate Captain G.R. Gopinath, sir. Oh, yes. Hey, this is a very small thing from our side. Give this, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
见证，老的见证。弟兄。Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Uh, I request all the participants to scan the QR code that is put up on the notice board for the feedback and uh, you'll automatically get the uh, digital certificate as soon as you submit the feedback. I would like to thank the management, the principal, the conveners and all teaching and non-teaching staff for attending the program. Thank you.